Welcome to Bodcast, the Business of Dentistry podcast, brought to you by Practice Plan. Bodcast delivers the best business advice, real life stories, and practical hints and tips to make your practice a more profitable and sustainable business. And now, here's your host. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Nigel Jones. I'm the Sales and Marketing Director of the Practice Plan Group of Companies. It includes Practice Plan, DPAS and Medentis. My great pleasure to welcome you to this latest podcast where we're going to be talking about the practice sales market, succession planning, all things connected to, to I guess, exit strategies, that kind of thing. And I'm delighted to be joined by Liz Hughes. Hi, Liz. Hi, Nigel. How are you? I'm good. I'm great. Thanks. I I wonder if you wouldn't mind um, introducing yourself for those in the audience that might be less familiar with you and your work. Yeah, sure. Um, As you say, my name is Liz Hughes. I'm the Managing Director of Frank Taylor and Associates, um, where we are our core businesses. We value and sell dental practices. We've been around for about 35 years. I um, joined the business um, in 2008, where I came to do a couple of days work consultancy and uh, never left. (laughs) <laughs> uh, 2008 is quite an interesting time to have uh, joined an organisation, I guess. Yeah, in, in a way, it's one of those things, isn't it? If you join when the things are really, really tight, which they were, it was an interesting way to sort of like grow the business. And actually, when I joined the business, there was probably only about five or six people. And then over the years, we've grown it and grown the divisions that work with us as well. So it's been a really interesting journey. And it's gone so quickly. Here we all are. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I, I feel the same thing because I actually joined um, Practice Plan in 2008 as well. Um, although I've been knocking around dentistry for 30 odd years, it was um, 2008 when I started with Practice Plan and I've watched um, FTA grow um, during that time and it's been been very impressive. So uh, I think it's, it's been really good to see. But it's it's yeah. been a very changing world during that time and uh, we're in the midst of a huge amount of change and uncertainty at the moment. So what what's your take on on the current dental market and, and obviously your specialised subject within that, the, the sales market? It's what, what has been interesting is um, for as long as I can probably remember, it's been very much a seller's market. And the demand has always been incredibly great, even in 2008, when at that point the bank stopped lending for quite a while. Um, private dentistry took quite a hit during that time um, and we saw the values of NHS practices going up considerably because people could see the benefit of buying an NHS practice and the security of the income coming in um, and it's 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 always been really solid I mean throughout um, the past 15 years we've had banks wanting to lend to dentists I mean we've still got 14 banks who want to lend to dentists in even in the current environment because dentistry is considered such a safe sector for the banks effectively um, in all the years I've been doing this, I've I've only dealt with two bankruptcy sales and they both involve property portfolios as, as opposed to the actual dental practice. So it's a really safe industry for the banks. Um, and there's always been a demand. Associates have always wanted to be practice owners and that, that actually hasn't changed. But what we have seen, in, particularly in the past 12 months, has been the challenge over interest rates, um, and for people looking to buy, not just looking to what's it going to cost them to buy a practice, but when they're looking at their own personal outgoings, where everyone has had mortgage rate increases, utility bills. So affordability has been a real um, question mark for a lot of our buyers, but it hasn't stopped the market. It's definitely a bit softer. Um, and when we talk to people where we valued practices maybe two years ago, um, there has been a shift in the desire for certain types of practices, which obviously influences the market. And, and how's that shift manifesting itself then? What what sort of things are people particularly looking for? Well, I think if we look back, when we had the lockdown and then when dental practices reopened and they had the ability to um, look at their private dentistry because they were only needed to, re- to actually perform 20% of the NHS contract, um, I think that gave a lot of dentists the opportunity to explore what private dentistry might look and feel like. Um, and obviously, when they went back to having to fulfil the NHS contract 100%, that was going to impact on their ability to do the private work. And we've definitely seen a shift where some principals have said, actually, I want to focus on the private work and maybe lose the NHS contract or certainly try and reduce the NHS contract. But what's really interesting is the, the, a, the, a lot of practice owners and potential practice owners have been concerned about finding associates to fulfil the NHS contract. 
So that in itself has proved a challenge. So whilst people have wanted to buy a practice, if the NHS contract is quite large, um, or if it's in a certain area where there's been a problem with recruitment, the concern has been if I buy this, then I can't get people to fulfil the contract. What am I doing? So it, there's been quite a shift in the market to attitude towards what kind of practice is the most desirable. Well, you see, I find this really quite interesting because we're working with a lot of practices at the moment who are handing back their NHS contract. And in some of that's um, just because they've had enough. But for a, a lot of them, it's simply the practicality of trying to get that recruitment issue addressed. So they've, they've basically given up, said, well, we cannot recruit an NHS associate. And the only way we could recruit more dentists into this practice is by offering them private positions. And that, I, I wonder what that does for the, the valuations of NHS practices. I, I, I guess it's there's not going to be um, uh, a kind of generalised answer that you can give me on that one. But in some cases, it, it must be having some kind of an impact. Yeah, there's definitely an impact. I mean, we are actually starting to see less of a concern about recruitment over the past three or four months. Um, there's definitely been an, it's not the top of the list of the conversations when I speak to practice owners, whereas there was quite a while last year where recruitment was the biggest issue that they were facing. Um, and I think, as I say, I think the biggest challenge we're all seeing, and it's quite a paradigm shift, is what do the associates want to do? And there's two things. One is uh, very rarely do we come across an associate who wants to work five days a week. Um, and very rarely do we come across someone who has an ambition to be an NHS dentist. And uh, that's quite a big combination. So if you've got a, a practice with a large contract that you've been dependent on associates to fulfil, anyone looking to buy it, it's a question mark as to whether they can actually fulfil the contract. And that does impact on the value because it's always, you know, buyers... Is, it's, it's buy and sell, sell and demand, isn't it? So if we don't have people who want to buy the contract, it will influence the value that's on the contract. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes absolute sense. And it's interesting, those two points that you mentioned there about attitudes of associates and uh, that, that, that sort of post-pandemic view that they don't want to work four and a half or five clinical days, that's certainly something that we're, we're coming across. I'm, I'm still sort of slightly mystified how to how people can publish an NHS workforce plan when they don't have accurate data about the number of FTEs working within the NHS. I, I, it's good that there's some kind of in, signal of intent, but how much substance there can be without that figure. But from your point of view, when, when you're getting the, the particulars of practices in, are you seeing that manifesting itself, people actually working less hours, fewer days, fewer sessions? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the ambition for and it's quite interesting because as an organisation, we've taken our team. So they work a nine day fortnight. So all our team now get one day off every 10 days to enjoy doing what they want to do, because we really like our team. They're highly trained. We don't want to lose them. And we feel there's more benefit when we spoke to them. They would prefer to get one day off every fortnight than a big pay rise because that's what they would prefer to do. And service levels haven't been affected. And that's really positive. Um, the challenge for dentists who own practices is if they cannot find enough associates to do the work, either they've got to do it. And I've got several practice owners who have gone back in to do dentistry purely to fulfil the contract because they can't get other dentists to do it. And I've got one guy in particular who his associates are all doing the private work and he is doing the NHS contract, which is crazy. And he's almost come out of retirement to do it because he wants to fulfil the contract before it gets sold. Yeah, I've heard similar stories. And, and you do think that um, what people have been aspiring to is, is the private dentistry working at a particular pace and to at the um, well towards the end of their careers, finding themselves going back to the treadmill um, must be quite a hard thing to take. Yeah. And I th when we talk to people about why do they want to, we have a, a view that says, why do you want to sell your business? Um, and you're either moving towards something. So you've either got great plans for your future or you're moving away. And, and you're moving away because of a distress. And we are talking to more people who want to move away from the burden of practice ownership than we are to people saying, I've just had such a great life. I want to do X, Y, and Z. I want to enjoy doing things in the future. So the majority, if I say, what's a driver for people to sell at the moment? It's probably more about actually being relieved from being a practice owner. And historically, people would say, I want to sell and just enjoy doing clinical work. But the clinical work probably isn't the NHS work they want to do. They want to enjoy doing their specialist private work where they've built relationships with their patients, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. 
Now, you, you mentioned, so if I try and weave together a few things you mentioned, actually, you mentioned about um, the, the the fact that um, people are wanting to move away from practice ownership. So they, they, in order to move away from practice ownership, they've got to find someone that wants to move towards practice ownership. So yeah. what advice would you give them in terms of sourcing that people or potentially preparing their own associates to take on the practice? Well, it goes back to we've always got people who want to sell and we've always got people who want to buy. Um, the buyers will actually end up driving the value because if people don't want to buy the practice, then you've got to look at the value that we've attributed. And if we look at practices that I mean, quite often when we when we get involved with the sale of a dental practice, we have a relationship with the seller for probably two years before it goes to the market in some cases because we start the journey with them. And if we valued a practice two years ago and then they decide now they, they'd like to sell it, we would have to go back and revisit anyway the value and more importantly, not just the turnover, but the multiple as to how more attractive is this practice? What does it look like and what are our buyers looking for? Um, and buyers do still want, they do want them the security, they do like a mixed practice, but if you had a practice that was predominantly NHS, it's far less attractive. I'm not saying you can't sell it because you can, but it's far less attractive than it was two years ago. Um, and that's because the buyers themselves are saying, can I fulfill the contract? Can I find the associates to do the work? And if you, you know, pre, pre-COVID, it was incredibly easy to find associates to do the work. Um, and the challenge that I think we're seeing is there is a paradigm shift in the associate's attitude. And I don't think it's just in dentistry. I think it's across all professions. We are seeing a very change, a shift in attitude as to how much work do I want to do? I want to enjoy a work-life balance. And all of these things are absolutely right. I mean, I'm so old. I come from the school of thought that you do as much work as you possibly can because that's what you're meant to do. And I don't think it's wrong that we've got a generation that says, actually, I want to enjoy life as well as do my job. No, I, I'm uh, a big fan of the um, 4,000 week book about um, how long an average lifetime is and uh, the fact that we've all become addicted to speed and to busyness, even in our personal lives. And I think I think you're right. Our sort of generation has has got that. And I, I look with a degree of admiration on um, people that are able to balance things a little bit more uh, carefully than perhaps I did. And I think as well now and, and for some of our practice owners, the majority of people are looking to sell we start talking to people about 52 when they start to think about what do I want to be where do I want to be (coughs) excuse me um and the majority of those guys have actually paid off their loan and they're in a position of uh yeah they're ready they're able to enjoy it The, the guys and the women who are looking to buy a practice have really got to look at the affordability and we build in now an affordability calculator so we can say to our buyers if you wanted to buy this practice it's going to cost you rule of thumb about X, Y, or Z. They've got to put 20% deposit down. Now, last year, and it continues now, mortgage rates going up, all your personal bills going up, the 20% that used to be quite easy to obtain has become tighter. Um, And then there's the risk of being a practice owner because sometimes they only start to think about the burden of ownership when they become owners. And there is a massive shift in between being an associate and going home at five o'clock to being that practice owner who actually starts his other job after five o'clock. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so um, one of the perceptions that a lot of people might have then is because of those sort of financial pressures that you were talking about, cost of living and the affordability point, that most practices are actually being bought by dental groups or dental corporates. Um, well, I see you shaking your head. So uh, that that's that's a, a widely held but a misperception, I'm guessing. No, absolutely. I think all the corporates have been on an acquisition trail for quite a while. And I think they are stopping to think about the profitability of their practices because, as I say, interest rates are affecting everybody. And um, the one thing that we have never lost is the desire from associates to be practice owners. We've never lost that. Even in the you know the first lockdown, we had more associates register with us in that three months than we had had for the previous year. Um, we continue to have people wanting to buy practices. But what we have, and I don't think it's a wrong thing, is a sense of the banks are being uber cautious, as they should be, as to um, how much money they're going to lend and the profitability of that practice going forward. And historically, NHS has always been 
a green tick for the for the banks and can continue to be but the cost of bringing the associates in to do the work probably reduces the profitability because practice owners are having to pay associates well and nurses better to do the work and yeah. their heating and lighting bills gone out etc cetera, etc cetera. um so i think it's that whole there's still the ambition to buy and there always will be the ambition to buy and there's always the ambition to sell but that maybe what we're seeing at the moment is a softer market because of the external influences that none of us have any control over. Brexit, Ukraine, fuel, none of those we can do anything about. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it is it is interesting because I, I mean, I, I have um, a client that's uh, converted a practice that was um, NHS, three NHS associates, all had left, couldn't fill the vacancies, was just about to close it down then advertised for three private associates, filled the positions almost immediately and has turned a practice that was on the verge of closure into a thriving private practice, which I think it shows what can be done now, but it also shows the competition that the NHS is up against. And uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I, I think when it's, I it's talk to people, Sorry, when I say when I talk to people, the practice owners and their can and it, then it be a bit filters through because if associates if associates only ever hear the practice owners moaning about how difficult they're finding the NHS, that doesn't aspire them to become practice owners with a big NHS contract. I think the practices that have a good mix of private capitation scheme, NHS, that's they're fine, they'll fulfill it. But if you have a practice that is predominantly NHS, that historically for us would have rocked off the shelves. That's that's the bit that we're seeing. They're not rushing off the shelves. So if we've got a practice that's probably a million pound NHS contract, it's a challenge to get the people to say, oh, I want to buy that. Because as I said before, the concern is, can we fulfill that contract? Yeah, yeah. It's it's very, very interesting times at the moment. And you look at just how much dentistry is featuring in the news with select committee reports, NHS workforce plan reports, all of the BBC type stuff from last year. It's um, it, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all pans out in the long term. And uh, I, I must admit, I, I don't yet sense that there's going to be a, a real change in the ability of NHS practice owners to compete for associates in a way that can safeguard the historical values. So it's going to be fascinating to watch. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely hearing of more people getting licenses now for sponsorship. So we've got more people coming in. And I think that that's going to ease the burden in some respects. But I think what we're also seeing, as I say, is an ambition of the next generation of dentists of what quality of life they want and as I say they, they, they don't come across many practice owners that say come and work in the NHS it's fabulous all we ever hear is a negative and from my point of view I would say to anybody if you buy a practice that's got an NHS contract probably now's a great time to do it because that contract can't be any worse than it is at the moment because NHS cannot afford to lose many more contracts and when I talk to people as I say historically said so I'm going to give my contract back you say, oh, they're not going to. But actually, people are considering it. And I would say to anybody who wants to sell this year or next year, probably don't just sell it as it is. But if someone comes to me and says, I want to sell in three or four years time, then it's a conversation I would certainly have if that was their ambition, because they will have time to actually convert to private and see the benefit of private. And, you know, our big driver is the bank's lending money. And as long as a practice is well run, banks like a capitation scheme, you know, gone are the years when there was issues around the capitation scheme. Banks see that as a serviceability of a loan, security. And as I say, the COVID period proved to everybody that the majority of our clients who had, you know, capitation schemes did not lose patients. And that money generated the security for the private practices that were closed for that time. Yeah, I mean, we certainly saw that. We had a number of our clients say that, uh, if it wasn't for um, their plan payments, they would have gone yeah. under during the course of that lockdown. So, uh, so, and and certainly we see that in the growth that we're experiencing at the moment. Yes, we're working with a lot of practices that are handing back contracts and wanting to make that move to private um, or at least mixed um, successfully. But also, some of the existing private practices are growing the number of patients they've got on plans rather than pay as you go because of that certainty point. Well, again, what was interesting is. Um, We've, we've dealt with so many practices who now say a new patient has to go on a plan. Mm. 
and the patients say yes of course I will that's fine so it's it's yeah. a positive and I suppose when, when we think about succession as I say we talk to people about why do they want what's motivating them to sell and I find it really sad when people just say I've had enough I, this the end of my career is not how I want it to be you know I think it's really sad that people have been in a profession for 20 30 years they want to go out on a high they don't want to go out on a I'm being beaten mentally beaten and that's I mean, we can remember when CQC came in and we had a rush of dentists at that point who said, I'm, I'm out, I'm done, I'm leaving. I can't cope with the CQC, the regulation. And we're getting the same kind of vibe from practice owners who have probably been, been a bit beaten over finding associates, finding nurses. I mean, the whole, say nurses, it seems to have calmed down now. But we had a period where nurses were so hard to find mm -hmm. and and I personally don't think it's a bad thing where the nurses are actually being paid a, a better salary than they were before um but for the practice owner finding staff is such you know employment HR when we talk to people the biggest pain in the backside after NHS is employment and HR really yeah yeah absolutely that that completely chimes with the feedback that we get from all the practices that we work with and um, no it's, it's interesting I think that, that you're right about the correction I think in dental nurse salaries and uh, or hourly rates I think that's uh, that's that's been actually a positive thing albeit it's put a lot of practices under financial pressure but we are in this this strange situation where the the the, the uh, lack of workforce or the reduced clinical hours that are available because of people going part-time or leaving the profession and things um creates a supply and demand imbalance that means that it yes it creates pressure but it also creates a position of strength and i think that those practice owners that you were talking about who are sort of so fed up with their practicing lives it's that is a real shame because there's never really been a better opportunity to shape what kind of practice you really dreamt of and really wanted because of that supply demand imbalance i think yeah i think the challenge and I, I actually it's, it's the worst thing I probably do but one of the nicest things I do is when someone says I just want to sell and by the time we finish they're like oh actually you give me some good ideas now I've thought about it I can do x y and z because sometimes people don't want to sell they just feel burdened by it and actually dentists do work a lot in splendid isolation so they don't have the support of other people around them um, and there's a there's a definite improvement in the attitude towards the business of dentistry over the past 10 years without a shadow of a doubt but they're still quite left alone and their concerns and fears and what I thought was interesting during lockdown was at the end of the three months there were certainly people who were saying to me I was thinking about selling but I spent the past three months looking at my practice and I've got some great ideas and I want to do x y and z kind of almost rejuvenated and other people who said I've so enjoyed I had one guy who said since I was a student, I've not listened to my record collection and I spent lockdown listening to my record collection. I want to sell my practice and just listen to music. It's great, isn't it? But people have to find a motivation. And I think as a business owner, sometimes you just get, I always use the word burden because that to me describes the best feeling of you can't sort of like get out because there's just too much going on. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree with you. Listen, I, I I'm conscious that we we we've um probably run out of time yeah. handsomely, but um we could carry on this conversation again at some point if you're up for it because I think oh, I think that there's a lot to still explore and unpack in this because I I, I mean for a start there's the fact that, that the value that you've provided in talking to someone and helping them see some of the positives in their practice and reevaluate. I guess that's what both of us are, are doing this for really ultimately is to help people feel happier and less burdened to use your your phrase no definitely and I think um as I say I, I love to talk to people who want to sell because they're ready for the next thing and sometimes it's actually to go on and do some specialist work that they've not had the chance to do the saddest point for me is when people just say I just simply had enough because yeah. it's just too negative and and I don't you know I much prefer the opportunity the way of moving forward towards something as opposed to running away from the horrors of it all yeah well i think that idea of moving towards something is a very positive note on which to end so thank you so much for your time we really thoroughly enjoy talking to you and as i say we'll definitely line up another one because um i think we could chat for quite a long time <laughs> brilliant thanks nigel really appreciated it thanks a lot thank Liz. you thank you